now? Better? Does it work? It's feedback now? Oh, because you're here. Did I say something? Do you want me to sing a Taylor Swift song or something? Because that's going to be really terrible. Yeah, no. I'm sure it's working. Because it was a battery. The light was out. Okay. Thank you. But the point here about dead weight losses, right? So before, you know, in the perfectly competitive outcome, this big triangle right here would be consumer surplus. The area between marginal costs and price over the range of production would be producer surplus. Now that you shift in, the triangle of consumer surplus is this small one here. Producer surplus is going to be this area right here. And you've lost the green area, right? So it's again, you're charging a higher price and producing a lower quantity than at the social optimal. So the green area will be dead weight loss. There is a tendency, and that's people who don't pay attention, that will want to fill and do not copy this, all right? They want to fill this part in this dead weight loss too. But why would dead weight loss ever be above demand between average cost makes no sense, right? Uh, so if you're unsure about which triangle, just go through the steps you know so well, but this here is the, the right uh, answer. All right, that's monopolistic competition. The coolest model uh, in all of economics, at least I like it. It makes me understand uh, supermarkets. Uh, I don't know if any of you have kids. If you think product differentiation in yogurt is bad, uh, try and get to like formula or stuff like that. It's absolutely crazy. The stuff they try and convince you of, the benefits uh, of these different products, it really makes your head spin. Uh, and then you start reading scientific papers about it and you get really nerdy. Okay. Market failure number three. We're going to get through as many market failures as I can in this class. So market failure three is something called non-uniform pricing. And it has nothing to do with uniforms, all right? It just means you charge people different prices, right? So, so far, both in the perfectly competitive market, as well as the, the monopoly and the monopolistic competition, every consumer pays the same price. It's the price that the firm charges. It's not Mac pays $100 and large pays 50 and, you know, Sam pays 20 based on, on characteristics that are either observable or not observable. So do different classes of consumers sometimes pay different prices? Yeah, student discounts. Do you still get student discounts anywhere? Movie theaters, all right, cheap movies, that's good. Uh, so, you know, based on an observable characteristic, I don't get a discount, right? But you, because you're a student, you get a discount, right? My mom uh, is very proud that she now gets a senior discount when she rides a bus. Uh, so she likes it. She's like, you didn't think I qualified for a senior discount, did you? Uh, so the point here is there's different ways of actually charging different individuals different prices, and I will show you why this is optimal from a firm's perspective and what this means for consumers and what this means from a social welfare point of view. So what we do see is that uh, competitive firms never do this, right? Because if a competitive firm changes its price, it no longer sells anything. So if you as a competitive firm raise your price above you know, whatever the competitive price is, you no longer sell because the market will buy from the people that charge the competitive price. So competitive firms never price discriminate or use non-uniform pricing. But non-competitive firms, right now the only non-competitive firm we know is a monopolist or a monopolistically competitive firm. Uh, so these firms use non-uniform pricing to increase profits. Well, that makes sense, right? Why would they do it otherwise? Do you really think movie theaters just like you better because you're students? No, right? I mean. Why would they, right? Firms maximize profits. They're not trying to shovel welfare dollars to students, right? They want to maximize profits. So why would you do this? So let's think about this. If a firm can price discriminate, uh, what it can do is it can charge uh, a higher price to some category of consumers that's willing to pay that price. Does Max go to the movies? Not often, but I did see all seven Fast and Furious movies in the theater. I'm very proud of it. And the ones that were available in IMAX, I saw in IMAX. Uh, not good dialogue, but this time they threw cars out of airplanes. I mean, come on. Uh, it was great. So. Do I really care what they charge me for a movie ticket? You know, within the sort of $25 range, frankly, I don't care. If I have three hours to myself in a movie theater, I'm willing to pay more than that, even. Uh, it's great. Uh, so I'm willing to pay a lot. Who here in this room would be willing to pay $25 to see Fast and Furious 7? Nobody. Really? No kindred spirits? Josh, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> our, our, our highly paid CSIs. I'm kidding. Uh, these guys are, are underpaid more than, yeah, well, let's not get into this. Uh, they're really, really underpaid. Uh, so their opportunity cost of being here is in the, in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So what you've got is the following. If you've got different classes of consumers, or you've got different consumers, it doesn't even have to be classes, you have different consumers that have a different willingness to pay for certain goods, if you could figure out what an individual is willing to pay, that's what you'd want to charge them, right? So what a movie theater would want to do is it would, at the front door, want to basically sit Max down with a lie detector and say, hey, Max, movie today, $50,000. What'd you say? I'd say, nah, I, I don't have $50,000. If I had $50,000, I'd sell my car and buy a Tesla. Uh, so, no. So we can keep on playing this game until at some point I reveal my true willingness to pay for a movie ticket uh, of Fast and Furious 7 with the incredible Vin Diesel in it, right? So the notion here is what the movie theater would really want to do if it could, it would like to get me to pay the maximum amount possible that I'm actually willing to pay given my preferences and my budget constraints and then make me pay that. What does the movie theater make me pay? I don't know, 15, 20, uh, something between 10 and $15, right? The price that everybody else who doesn't get a discount gets to pay. Same thing. Think about a bartender, right? Thirsty Max walks in. After I've popped my 28, you know, IS-106 lectures and review sessions and so on, I'm thirsty. So I'm going to walk straight down to Jupiter's, and I'm going to sit down at the bar at 4 in the afternoon, maybe even at 2, and I'm going to have a pint, all right? Uh, so when I sit down there in the bartender, if he would actually be able to figure out what my true willingness to pay is for that first pint, it's near $100, probably, because it'll be a warm day, uh, I'll have worked hard, uh, it's been a good semester, uh, and I need a pint, right? So the bartender would like to be able to charge me $100, but, you know, he'll charge me whatever's in the menu. So price discrimination gets exactly at that. You would like to charge people uh, their willingness to pay, so get this higher amount of revenue from Max, because his willingness to pay is higher than the current price. But what if, instead of charging everybody the same price, you could charge people their willingness to pay, right? So the price is currently $10. What is that noise outside? The door itself? That sounds exciting. Uh, but let's get back to economics. Uh, so at $10, right, a pint, are we locked in? OK, there's a trade-off. Welcome to the world of trade-offs. We've spoken about this all semester. But if the price for a pint is $10, Right, the firm loses out on the sales from people who are willing to pay, let's say, 6 or $7, right? So if you can price discriminate and you can charge everybody exactly what they're willing to pay, you capture the consumer surplus from the people with really high willingness to pay. But by being able to walk further down the demand curve, you're also able to expand sales to groups of individuals who have a slightly lower willingness to pay, and you capture that part of the market as well. So price discrimination is a really, really cool thing. Let's think about how that works, right? The first thing you need, and that's what we always forget, not every firm can price discriminate, you need market power, right? So the way 
uh, this always works. This is a local monopoly or a product differentiated firm or, or something like that. But you need to be able to raise price above the, the perfectly competitive uh, price. Right. So movie theaters are product differentiated. Some people like big screen multiplexes. Others like their little, you know, what do we call them, local theaters uh, that used to play independent movies, which they don't anymore. Uh, but the point here is the firm needs to have market power, and consumers need to have different demand elasticity. So they need to have a different willingness to pay for the same product. High income people are more likely willing to pay more for a given good than, than lower income people for stuff that we all like. The other thing that you've got to be able to do, and these three points are really critical, so you should remember these, is the firm has to be able to prevent resale. I'm sorry about this door. Uh, the firm has to be able to prevent resale, because otherwise, you just show up in the morning, you buy movie tickets with your student discount, right, for the whole theater on the day Fast and Furious 7 comes out, and then at 